wondering what to do next. <laughs> Why don't we turn around and greet one another? <coughs> Where were you? What's the next song? The Lord needs a prayer. Um, okay. Yeah. That music sounded so good. It sounded so Where'd good. Where'd my music go? You? Good morning, everyone. Oh, oh, oh. Good morning. Hi, do you want to give me a hug? Do you want to give me a hug? One, two, I don't want to say hello right now. I'm about to die. What key do you play it in? We're do down three, right? All right, you guys are doing really good. No one told you to stand up. You're doing that already. So I'm really impressed with you guys. So praise the Lord. Let's continue worshiping the Lord.
going to be uh, in Jonah. And if you're familiar with the story of Jonah, Jonah runs from the Lord, right? And uh, the next song that we're about to sing is called, What a Beautiful, what a beautiful Name. And there's a proverb, Proverbs 18.10, that tells us what the righteous do when it comes to the Lord's name. Listen to the word of the Lord as we sing this next song. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Isn't that a wonderful truth? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. Right? Jonah is showing that he's unrighteous, as we'll see. He runs away from the name of the Lord. Let's sing together, continue worshiping the Lord. What a beautiful name. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name. Thank you. 
Well, praise the Lord, and good morning to you all. I invite you to open up your Bibles to, perhaps maybe you've never opened up to this book before in the Scriptures, the book of Jonah. Uh, today will be a little bit of an introduction, and we'll look at the first six verses of this book, and then uh, after that we'll tackle the rest of chapter 1, and then from there, therefore, from forward on, we will look at just each chapter at a time in each sermon, um, Lord willing. That's my plan. Today's message is called The Rebel, or A Rebel, and the Storm-Making God. And it's a wonderful story. So today, I have some good news for you. I have some bad news, and I have a little bit of hard news. We begin a new series, as I said, in the book of Jonah. And as I said last week, I want to begin teaching in 2019 in the Old Testament Scriptures. Those of you who know me know, since you've been here, we've been doing a lot of New Testament studies. I'm much more comfortable in the New Testament, a lot more applicable teaching in the New Testament, a lot easier to find application, right? Um, but uh, God doesn't always want us to become comfortable. He wants to stretch us, and I need to be stretched in my studying and my preaching as well, and I want to stretch you as well as we look into the Old Testament Scriptures. And so I told you I had good news, bad news, and hard news, right? Well, this is the good news. The good news is that uh, God loves you. God loves you, and He's chosen you and I, the church, to be His witnesses to the world all around us. It is a fact that the best argument for God to the whole world is the church. It's the best argument. Every day, God becomes accessible to a hurting and dying world through the people of God. We can do that through our simple acts of compassion and servanthood in the way that we worship in the ministry of the Word of God. We make that which is invisible visible before this world. That's the good news. The bad news is that it can be argued that the worst argument, the worst argument for God is the church. Every day God becomes more remote and still remote to a cynical world because of the people of God. And the reason is because in our foolish acts of self-righteousness and self-indulgence, in our judgment and in our smugness, and through our breaking of what we should be doing, trusting in God, we obscure God. We're the ones who should be making God visible, the invisible visible to a lost and dying world. The good news, the bad news, and the hard news is this. God doesn't have a plan B. God does not have a plan B. Now, he loves you and I so much that because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary and what he's promised to do in your life and in my life, God is going to do, listen to me, God is going to do whatever it takes to produce obedience in our lives. He's going to do whatever it takes. You see, the church lives between the splendor of God's intent, what His intentions are, 
and the spectacle of our own shortcomings. God live, we live in between that. The story of Jonah is a short and fascinating story. In fact, in all the Bible, Jonah is the one character that I would encourage you not to emanate, not to copy. As we see Jonah, he defies God. He sits in the belly of a whale for three days. He preaches to his most hated enemy, the Assyrians. Then he gets into a shouting match with God. Bottom line is this, that popular phrase, WWJD, what would Jesus do, does not stand for what would Jonah do. We should not copy Jonah. But in this study, I hope for us to all see a reflection of ourselves. Jonah is not just a message to those who are preachers, for we know Jonah is a prophet. But it's not just a story that we would apply just to preachers, those who preach or teach the Word of God. Uh, Jonah is a message for every believer who knows the Word of the Lord and knows that they've been commanded by the Lord to spread the good news to all nations and all people of the world. And instead of obeying the Lord, we live our lives in rebellion to the Lord and His Word. But the story of Jonah is even bigger than that. It's bigger than Jonah. It's bigger than you and me. It's bigger than Jonah and his disobedience. It's a story of God's amazing and relentless compassion. That he has compassion on sinners. Yes, he has compassion on Jonah, but he also has compassion on you and me. He loves you, he loves me, and he loves Jonah. He has an absolute resolve to do whatever it takes to bring his people, you and I, into submission, to live out his heartbeat, to be on mission with God. And so I invite you to turn to Jonah, and I, won't, I want to read verses 1 through 9. I will only be teaching verses 1 through 6 this morning, but I'm going to make a reference to other portions in this section of Scripture. Listen to the word of the Lord, and then I will ask the Lord to bless it to our lives. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, uh, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners, the sailors, were afraid, and every man cried out to his own God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, one another Come, let us cast lots that we may not that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Jonah, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Or where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And so he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. God, I pray your blessing upon uh, this section of Scripture. Your word will come alive to each one, and you will have your way in our lives. Of this I pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. And
And so as we begin this study of Jonah, I think it's uh, also important as a way of introduction to understand who this person Jonah is. For most of us, all we know is Jonah and this big fish, right? Um, you heard it through Sunday school. If you were raised as a Christian, you've heard this story multiple times. It's a great story to turn to when you're teaching children of this great fish that swallowed up this guy, right? And so we've heard this story over and over again. And so for most of us, I would say probably everybody in this church right now, maybe I could be wrong, know Jonah or know about Jonah from the book of Jonah. Amen? Raise your hand if that's true. All right? We'll get done fast if you just participate with me. All right? Going to do a little bit of this, okay? All right, good. But you know, Jonah, we see here, he's a prophet. And we don't know about Jonah just from the book of Jonah. I want to invite you to, you don't have to turn to it. Mark's going to put it up in a moment. And uh, this early in my sermon, I'm not going to entertain you with me trying to pronounce words that I can't pronounce, okay? Just so you know. But in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 to 25, I'm not going to read all of this and give you entertainment for later on today when the Patriots are playing football. But uh, it says that there's a reference here in, this, in these verses, verses 23 to 25, to the prophet Jonah. You see it there in verse 25, that he's a prophet of Israel, and he prophesies to this king, Amaziah, okay? Uh, we don't know much about that king because it says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so most of the kings that, are, that we have record of that did evil in the sight of the Lord, there's not much said about them except that they did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. And so this king was living in dis disobedience to the Lord. He's the king of Judah. But the Lord tells Jonah, who is a prophet, to go to Jonah in verse 25. It says that he, he the king, restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel. Let, catch this. Which he had spoken through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. And so Jonah is a prophet, and he has a good record here. He's being used of the Lord to prophesy and to tell this king to fortify your boundaries because the enemy is going to come up against you from that direction. The king listens to what Jonah says, and he fortifies that boundary. And so Jonah is a prophet. Jonah's a good prophet. He obeys the Lord. So when the Lord tells him to go, for the most part, all his life so far, up to this point right here in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah listened to the Lord. Perhaps you can relate to that. You do your best to listen to what God tells you to do. But there's that one or two things that you say, no, I am not going to listen to you on this matter. You might not shake your fist at God and have a shouting match with him, but there's places in all of our lives that if we're honest, Lord, I give you this, you can have that, I'll listen to you on this, but I'm not going to listen to this. We don't say that, but we do it with our actions. We don't listen to the Lord. And so Jonah is told by the, told by the Lord to go to Nineveh and to cry out against it, prophesy against it, because the Lord says, in verse 2, cry out against it, this great city, Nineveh, for their wickedness has come up before me. It's almost like God can smell their wickedness. And in, in fact, in, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, when the Lord wanted to know more about Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent his message, messengers down there, and they got a closer look. And so perhaps this is a little bit of a... Of, Angels coming before the Lord and, and giving to the Lord exactly what is going on. Not that he doesn't know, but he wants to hear it from his messengers. And so it comes up before him, however that might look like. But it's their wickedness, the city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital, capital of Assyria. Now, I'm not sure if you know much about this, but uh, Assyria would be in present day today Iraq, right? And uh, it was, it's an ancient city, it's no longer there today, but it's a city that was popular. Nineveh was the capital of this city. And if you know this or not, I'm not sure, but the founder of Nineveh can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, the founder of Nineveh. His name is Nimrod. 
He's the son of Cain who rejected the Lord. And he also went away from the presence of the Lord. And so this city is filled with people who are brutal and wicked enemies of God as well as the Israelites, the Assyrians. They would be very familiar, very similar, I should say, in in the way that they do things, their tactics, like uh, the radical Islamic terrorists called ISIS and how they would go into different parts of the Middle East and come into a city and they would gather all the women together. They would rape the women. They would kill their husbands. And history tells us that they would also cut the lips off of those whom they conquered. These were the Assyrians that, that Jonah is told to go preach to Nineveh, this great city. Now, we don't know if this is true, but it's possible that Jonah's parents were killed by the Assyrians. We don't know it for sure. But we know Israel hated the Assyrians. We know how Jonah feels about the Assyrians. He doesn't want to go tell them or show them any kind of kindness whatsoever. He just wants judgment to come to them. He wants them to get what they deserve. That's what Jonah wants. So as we read this letter, Jonah, there's lots of debate on how we should interpret it. Is this story of Jonah just a fairy tale? Should it be taken literally or figuratively? I mean, did a man named Jonah actually get swallowed up by a great fish? Some say it's a whale, right? But did it actually really happen? Why should we believe that this story is really true? Well, the scholars argue like crazy about this. It was believed by most modern-day church historians up until the 1900s or so, and then all of a sudden people began to debate whether or not it's true or not. The late great evangelist Billy Graham was once asked if he believed the story of Jonah, that a man was actually swallowed by a big fish and that he stayed in that fish for three days and then came out alive. Well, Billy Graham, he's with the Lord right now, but he said, sure, I do. I believe that story. And the person who asked him the question was amazed. He said, how can you believe in such a thing? Well, Billy said that he believed that the Bible was the word of God and that everything that it said was true. And Billy went on to say this. In fact, if, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed a great fish, and that, that great fish was in Jonah's belly for three days and three nights, if the Bible said that, I would believe it as well because it's the word of God. Amen? And, but we ask this question. Why should we believe something, something so bizarre as this story of a man being swallowed by a fish. Well, we believe it because we believe the Bible is God's word. And up to this point, I've read many arguments for different contradictions in the Bible, but I have not found one thing, one argument that stands and that can convince me not to trust the Bible to be the word of God. And so we believe the Bible to be true and accurate and that this is a story that is, that is historical fact, that it should be trusted and believed. But more than that, The reason why we believe that this story that's happening about Jonah is true and historical fact is because Jesus believed it. Do you hear me? Jesus believed in the story of Jonah. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 through 41. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he answered them and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. You see it? And so he's comparing the evil and, and adulterous generation, like the Pharisees at that time, who were asking for a sign. He says, no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is that sign? Verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus is saying, just like I will die, I will be buried, and I will be in the ground for three days and three nights, the resurrection. That's true. You believe that, amen? Right? Just as that is going to happen, it equates that the same thing, just as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, the same thing is going to happen to me 
Jesus believe in this story that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. And he goes on to give us more historical fact of the people of Nineveh and what they did to the preaching of Jonah. Look at verse 41. He says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Amen. And so Jesus believed in the story of Jonah. That's why I believe in the story of Jonah. That's why I take this story that's here as an hi historical fact that it actually did take place. And it's true. As we consider what is the main point of this story that we're looking at this morning, the main point of the story is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign, meaning God is all powerful. God controls this life that we have. And that means also that he has the right. God has the right to tell his people what to do. I don't know if this is encouraging or not, but listen to this. God doesn't always tell you and I to do something that we're comfortable with. God doesn't always tell you and I to do something that we're comfortable with, nor will he tell you and I always to do something that we like. God isn't always going to do that. And that's what we're going to learn in this story. There are two main characters in this story. One is God, and the other one is Jonah. Jonah represents people today who are rebellious toward the word of the Lord. God is seen in this book as sovereign, yet compassionate towards sinners, even Jonah. And he'll stop at nothing to produce obedience in the life of his people. God tells Jonah to go tell a people to repent, and Jonah doesn't want to. He, rep he represents people who disobey the Lord and find out the hard way. Oh, is that so true? And find out the hard way that the Lord and His will will always be accomplished. It'll always be accomplished. Whatever God's will is, it will be accomplished in your life and my life. Jonah represents every one of us. For we, like Jonah, are told to be the Lord's witnesses to all this world. We are told to spread His glory everywhere we go. We are told to tell this world that Jesus is the only way. In essence, every believer is a disciple. We are all disciples. And every disciple is commanded by the Lord to make disciples. That is God's mission for every believer's life. You are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every disciple ought to be making disciples. That could be in your home, but it ought not end there. It needs to begin there, but it needs to go beyond your home. As it says in the great commandment, the great commission, I should say, that we're to be disciple, make disciples of all nations, of all peoples of the world. That is God's commandment to you and I. And we, like Jonah, disobey that commandment. And like Jonah, we don't think it's a big deal. And we come up with many different reasons and many different excuses why we, do not, we don't listen to it. We might say things like, God, you don't, know, you don't know the kind of work environment that I have. You don't know the work environment that I have. You don't know the school that I go to. It, it, nobody wants to listen to the gospel. You don't know the community that I live in, Lord. People avoid me like I have the plague. Lord, you don't know. I don't know, I don't know enough. I, I might talk to somebody and I won't have an answer for their objections. Lord, you don't know that I, I can't say something because if I say something, people will re reject me. I'll lose friends. I might even lose my promotion that I received. I can't speak up, Lord. Fear is probably the biggest and the most popular excuse that every one of us, including myself, give to the Lord. Those are excuses, but there's probably one really good reason to share the faith, our faith with the lost on a regular and consistent basis as a way of life. And the reason is the Lord has commanded us to. The Lord has commanded us to do this. And rebelling against his commandment, like any other commandment, is detrimental, detrimental to our Christian growth. And we, we will also add to that that we are taking chances with the consequences 
from an almighty and powerful holy God. And so what we will learn from this book of Jonah, the rebel and the storm-making God, is the story of Jonah is not just for the preacher. It can only relate to a few of us. The message is for everyone who has experienced the grace of God in their life but fails to tell other people about that grace. All of us can and all of us must relate to this story. He is a rebel and against the Lord's word, which calls every one of us to tell all people about our great God and loving King. And so there's three lessons I want to share with you this morning from this section of Scripture. Number one, rebellion could lead to complete rejection of the Lord. Rebellion could lead to complete rejection of the Lord. One of the most powerful messages that we learn from the story of Jonah is the power of sin in a person's life. And it doesn't matter how little of a sin it might be. All sin is evil in God's eyes. We might pick and choose what things are really bad, and what things we're going to get in trouble with, and then the next thing you know, you're comfortable with that excuse you made in your life. It happens to all of us. It doesn't matter. All sin is sin in God's eyes. I want to show you a decline in Jonah's life. I want to show you a descent in Jonah's life, a, de- a, d- a natural downgrade of what happens in Jonah's life because he's not obeying the Lord. We see his intentions in verse 3. After he's commanded, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Look at the, the, the decline, the descent. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and again, he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I want to point out a number of things from this text. Notice three times the author highlights where Jonah is going and where he's not going. Three times Jonah is said to be going to Tarshish. Three times it mentions that. Two times it mentions that he's trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Jonah is told to go to Nineveh, but instead he goes into the complete opposite direction of what the Lord is telling him to do. Nineveh is perhaps 500 miles northeast from where Jonah is. Tarshish is the opposite direction, northwest, about 2,000 miles, and that is where Jonah is going. He is trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. What are we to make of that? Somebody trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. Do we really believe or do we think that Jonah believes that he can actually flee from the presence of the Lord? Do we actually think that that's what Jonah believes in his heart, that I can get away from God? Of course not. Jonah reveals to the sailors there in verse nine, verse nine, he says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear or I worship the Lord God of heaven. And what did this God do? This God made the sea and the dry land. Jonah doesn't believe in his heart doctrinally that he can actually free, flee from the Lord. He's not acting by his beliefs. It's a lesson for us to understand. This is what sin does to you and I. The person doing it does not normally think rational. And the reason why is because our hearts are so deceitful and desperately wicked. We, like Jonah, think that we can actually hide something from God. We're not thinking rationally. We're not acting by our beliefs. We're actually just doing something following the deception of our own hearts, thinking that we can hide something from God. No, Jonah believes that the Lord is everywhere, that the the Lord is all-powerful, that the Lord controls all things. But he's not thinking about that right now. He's not thinking about that right now. He just wants to get away from God. That's what sin does. It wants us to stay away from the Lord. Sin wants us to stay far away from the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 13, it says, Beware, brethren, lest any of you in an evil heart 
of unbelief. Depart from the living God. You would, you would think those words are being spoken to people who don't know Jesus. But look, beware, brethren. God is talking to you. He's talking to me. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. He's saying to us that sin is powerful and sin is deceitful. He goes on to say that's why we need each other. That's why we should not try to live our Christian life apart from each other, but that we should practice community and spend time in fellowship with one another. That's what he says in verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What is sin? Sin is deceitful. And every one of us can be deceived in our own hearts. We make up excuses and we, we obey the Lord here, but we don't obey him there. And next thing you know, this part of disobedience becomes greater than this part of obedience. And we've deceived ourselves. And what we're trying to do is to hide our disobedience from the Lord. But we can't hide from the Lord. I want you to think about Jonah's disobedience a little bit more. All of this trouble began with the simple disobedience to the word of the Lord to go to Nineveh and to preach to them. And his disobedience led to an outright rebellion to want to flee from the presence of the Lord. And so God's word is telling us something here. It is warning us not to take simple disobedience for granted. Don't take it for granted. All disobedience to the word of the Lord is to be taken seriously because all disobedience could lead to a complete rejection of the Lord in our lives. So how about you? How about me? We're not told to go to Nineveh, but we are told to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. We are told to be his witnesses. We are told to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That's Jesus' command. So this is not far removed from what the Lord told Jonah. So we are too. We need to see this as a command for us to obey, lest our disobedience leads to outright rejection of the Lord. You and I can be guilty of picking and choosing what to obey. And in a sense, we're acting like God. And we wonder why things are not working out for us the way we want them to. We need to be careful because we are heading on a pathway of disobedience that will lead to so much unnecessary trouble in our lives. I want you to think about one more thing. Would you want the Lord to respond to your word as you respond to his? The day that you and I are in trouble and we need the Lord's help and you call out to him, what if the Lord did the same thing that you and I do? Delayed obedience is still disobedience. I want you to think about it the next time you're in a conversation with somebody. And God opens the door. You don't have to barrel through and say, hey, Jesus loves you. You're a sinner. You know, right in their face kind of a stuff. You don't need to do that. God knows who you are. You know who you are, right? You pray and begin your day, Lord, here I am, use me. Right? Then you go to work. Then you go to school. And you do whatever you're doing. You ask the Lord to use you. He's going to use you if you're willing to be used. A door will open. The question is, are you going to go through that door and share Jesus with that person when God does open the door for you? That's what you need to be praying about. Rebellion could lead to a complete rejection of the Lord. Number two, rebellion is asking for the discipline of the Lord. Rebellion is asking for the discipline of the Lord. The next thing we learn is that rebellion is asking for the discipline of the Lord. As you look at verse 4, it says, But the Lord, in contrast to what Jonah is doing, sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then I'll read verse 5. Then the marinas were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. 
in response to Jonah's disobedience, it says, the Lord, not Satan, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And I want you to understand something about this. It's very, very important. That the Lord is willing to break up this ship, drown Jonah, and all these worship, idol worshiping sailors, they're all going to perish. God is willing to do that all in response to Jonah's disobedience. Did you catch that? That's what it says there. This great wind comes. It's the, 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 the ship is about to be broken up. God is sending this to get Jonah's attention. And so it is true that the Lord will make a storm come into your life and into my life, and he will wreak havoc on your life and on my plans and on your plans if you belong to him and you are disregarding his commands. Yes, the Lord will allow this to happen. He, he might, in his grace, be patient. And allow you to continue to go down a pathway that you shouldn't be going. He might be graceful and be compassionate and wait and let you go further and further and further. But don't be surprised if he sends a storm into your life as an act of discipline for not listening to him. A great storm. Peter tells the believers in his letter to them, verse 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For a little while, God might send a trial, like a storm, to come into your life and my life so that we might our faith might become genuine, pure as gold. God says gold is not that valuable, but your faith is much more valuable. Amen? And then in verse 12 of chapter 4 of 1 Peter, God says, Don't think it's strange concerning a, the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Don't be surprised, he's saying. Don't be surprised. So, wow, why is this happening to me? Like, as, as though we don't deserve a trial. We all deserve it. If God gave us what we all deserve, we all will be in trouble. Amen? But he doesn't give us what we deserve. Well, the question I ask is, why is God responding to Jonah's disobedience in such a hard way? Lighten up, God, will you? Come on. Just a little disobedience. I can go to Nineveh some other day when I feel like it. Come on. Right? Lighten up. Goodness. Well, God responds this way because rebellion against God is serious. All sin is evil. God doesn't brush it off or put it under the carpet. Sin is an affront. Sin is an affront to God's holiness. Our God is a light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. God cannot be tempted by evil. God's eyes are too pure to look upon sin. If he were to permit Jonah or you and I to sin, he would not be holy, and we could therefore rebel against everything and anything, he says, without concern of the consequences. His commands, listen to me, would become to us as just good advice from some well-meaning deity rather than absolutes from an almighty and powerful God. In Jonah's rebellion, the Lord sent a great storm to wake up Jonah. And Jonah didn't want to wake up. These seasoned sailors, sailors uh, they act out of fear. They know this storm is not a regular storm. Uh, they can read the sky. They know when a storm is coming, and they would have been prepared for it. But this was a divine storm, and every one of them began to pray to their God to no use whatsoever. They hurl all the cargo from the ship. They pray and work as they go, right? Doesn't help them. Their evasive actions are useless and ridiculous because when you're dealing with the Lord, you can't fight against Him. We should all learn that. The Lord does not want their cargo off the ship. He wants the heart 
of his servant to turn to him in repentance. If anyone should be a scared, scared, should be Jonah. He knows the power of the Lord. He knows the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, just like he disciplined the Corinthian church when many of them were either on a sickbed or on a deathbed because they did not obey the Lord when it came to the Lord's Supper and they were showing contempt to the poor people. So what's the lesson for you and I? Just like Jonah, you and I can experience a storm in our life. God can send a storm to your income. God can send a storm to your health. God can send a storm and crush someone's grades or their scholarship or their dreams. If they are heading to Tarshish instead of heading to Nineveh and obeying the Lord, the Lord will wreak havoc in your life and my life. Why? Because of His grace, because of His mercy. He'll send a storm into your life to crush whatever things you're doing that are not His will. Why? Because He loves you. And He wants you to serve Him with all your heart, soul, and might. So may we learn that lesson regarding Jonah, that rebellion is asking for the discipline of the Lord. My last and final point is real quick here. Rebellion denies the only hope of God. Rebellion denies the only hope of God. Here are these sailors in verse 6. The captain goes down and wakes up Jonah. What are you doing, sleepyhead? Wake up. We're, we're all about to die here, right? Jonah's sound asleep. It reveals to us that Jonah does not care about his life. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about the storm. He doesn't care about anything but sleep. Now listen, if you're worried about something, those of you who can relate to this, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, you know, what do you call it? Um, I'm not a sleep expert, all right? I know a little bit about sleep because I, I do it every night, right? But I know this much, that if you are worried about something, if you have deep concern in your life, you're going to have a hard time sleeping, amen? Right? So Jonah doesn't have a concern, doesn't care about the people, and I want you to catch this. That's you, that's me. Because we have the greatest message. We know the wonderful Savior, what a beautiful name He has. And we have the only hope for sinners. And we're asleep, like Jonah, not a care in the world. And there's people who are dying and on their way to hell. And we have the only hope of God. And just like Jonah is sound asleep and doesn't care and needs to be rebuked by this captain of the ship, and get up and pray to your God, and maybe he can help us. You and I know God. We know he's good. We know he's glorious. We know he's merciful. We know it's a wonderful thing to know God and to be saved and be forgiven of all of our sins. Amen? How can we keep the gospel to ourselves? How can we keep the gospel to ourselves? This letter of Jonah is a wake-up call in 2019 for Calvary Baptist Church, for every one of us to see our call in life, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, and disciples make disciples. Did you hear that? Disciples make disciples. Find somebody. Find somebody to disciple. Find someone. Get your eyes off yourself and your own problems. You're, there's many of them. We all got problems. And if you just focus on what's going on in your life and all your problems, you're going to be a discouraged individual. And the greatest medicine for discouragement and all the negativity that's going on in our world and our life and, and the things that we wish would be better is service to God. Serve the Lord. Get our eyes off ourselves and find someone that we can be compassionate to and share the gospel with. So the lesson is don't be like Jonah. <laughs> be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. 
Jesus knows your sin. He knows my sin. And yet he went to the cross of Calvary and he hung there for six long hours and took the punishment that you and I deserve. And he offers everyone forgiveness. I would be a, I would be a terrible, terrible pastor. Terrible Christian. If I didn't end my message with this. Perhaps you're here today and you're like one of those sailors who have no hope. You're crying out to a false god or whatever it might be. and You've never turned from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're on your way to hell. There's no other easy way or soft way to put that. If you've never turned from your sin of saying, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm lost. I don't want to go to hell. I believe Jesus died for me on that cross. I trust him to save me. If you've never done that, you sit here right now. And you're lost. You're like Jonah. You don't have a care about anything about, but yourself. But in a sense, care about yourself right now. Care about your relationship with God and call out to him. When I close in a word of prayer, would you bow your head in a moment and call out to Jesus to save you? Trust him to be your savior? Maybe... If you realize you have not been faithful to the Lord's command to be his witness, in our time of prayer this morning, you should ask the Lord to forgive you. Don't keep living that way. God, please forgive me. And then start each day with your hands like this and go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be your servant. Use me today. Whether it be discipling your children and then one day you're discipling someone else, look for someone to disciple. Then at work, Check this out. You'll like this. When somebody asks you, how was your weekend? You can say, oh, it was great. I went to church on Sunday. Don't leave it there. I heard an awesome sermon. Make sure you say it was awesome, right? Okay? And it told, that sermon told me how I can be forgiven of all my sin. Just leave it there and see what happens, right? The person's going to walk away and say, well, I could be forgiven of all my sin. Oh, that guy is pretty crazy. That girl is whacked out. What? You planted a seed. They might stay there and say, well, tell me about the sermon. You never know what they're going to do, but try it. And then I would say also, get into the habit and inviting, of inviting people to church. We have these little cards that you can use just to give the person that you, you, had, you had a meal at a restaurant, give a good tip, and then leave them this little booklet, this little uh, card that invites them to come to Calvary Baptist Church. You should do that as a habit. Offer to pray with people. And what I'm saying is this. Be on mission with God. Don't be like Jonah. Amen? Let's pray. And every head bowed and every eye closed, perhaps... Today is the day for you. October 30th, 1988 was my day. And every day since then, as God has spoken to me and challenged me, I try to respond. What's your response today in the message of Jonah? Don't emulate him. Don't copy him. Be like Jesus. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus, call out to him right now where you're sitting. If you've, if you've been acting like Jonah, you don't have to continue that way. Turn from that life. Take the next step of obedience toward the Lord. Don't wait for anybody. If your husband's not doing it, you need to do it, do it. If your wife is not doing it, but you need to do it, you do it. Be an example. They'll follow you. God, I pray you'll have your way in all of our hearts. Help us to put this message to practice and not just say, oh, that was great. Have your way. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we all stand? And as we sing this song unto the Lord, we give an invitation here, a response from God for you to slide out of your pew. If you need to go somewhere and pray with somebody, if you want to if you want someone to share the gospel with you and pray with you to make sure that you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, obviously I can't leave and go with you, but we got people that, we, that I know I trust with the gospel and they'll take you.
to talk to you and, and, and encourage you and pray with you. We've got rooms in the back and rooms in the front here. Just slide out of your pew if God has spoken to you. Let's sing on to the Lord. It's taken me some time to believe that when you said it's done, that's what you mean. That when they drove the nails through your hands, you did not recant, you didn't take it back. drink the cup of death it's running through my veins i chose my bride instead of the glory